Hello, marhaba. Thank you for joining the podcast by Shalhoub Group. Today, I'm not only wearing Stella McCartney for the podcast, I have the pleasure of chatting with Stella McCartney herself, a force in the fashion industry. In 2001, she launched her brand to the world with a steadfast commitment to sustainability and with Mother Earth in mind. A lifelong vegetarian, she never uses leather, fur, or skin in any of her designs or material. Currently, she sits on the Sustainability Advisory Board at LVMH, and in her role, she continues to push boundaries with sustainable material innovation and supply chain ethics. Stella McCartney, thank you very much for joining our podcast. Hello, and welcome to Dubai. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before I talk about why you're in Dubai, which is exciting and it's coming up, let's go back to the essence of your brand. It's the intersection of purpose, innovation, and sustainability. Tell me more about it. Well, I um, thank you for having me again. I was brought up on an organic farm in England as a vegetarian with two very, I would say, out-of-the-box thinking personalities, change makers and pioneers. Um, and that kind of set me up for for life in, a, in an approach and how I come at things, how I see the world through a very different lens, I think, from a lot of other people. Um, and I knew at an early age that I wanted to be a fashion designer, a very, very early age. But I went into the industry as time went on and I realized that I couldn't compromise my ethics and my moral codes for the industry that really is based on a lot of... Um, unsustainable and unfriendly methods at the end of the day. So I never work with leather um, or fur or feathers, or certainly any skins. And that was the the sort of journey, the, the starting point of my journey. And especially at a time that was unheard of. I was definitely ridiculed. I was made fun of for working in this way because let's face it, you know, here we are today and the majority of the brands that I can see outside of my own store are based on leather or animal agriculture for their sales. So my approach was considered to be very strange and, um, and you know, very original. Um, and so from that starting point, I just stayed committed. It's very much my belief system. And I, I started the brand with with that at the core of everything that I did. And also it meant that I had to work in a very, very different way. From the start, I had to look at a very different supply chains. I had to design very differently. I had to, you know, there were not very many um, alternatives to leather that I could work with at that time. So we also had to train are, uh, you know, the people that make the bags in Italy that normally work with leather, we had to train them to work in a different way. We had to use different machinery. And um, so from day one, I've been approaching things very differently. And here we are 20 years later, and now I'm at COP28 here in Dubai. And this is a conversation that I think people find a lot less strange and um, isolating. So I'm, I'm happy that it's Absolutely. It's moved and I on. think with the fashion industry contributing to around 8% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, it's a very serious uh, topic that we're having today. And I think people have a bit more affinity towards it. But you really started with innovation at heart because you had to create the, the ways of, of making fashion and clothes. So tell us a bit more about the innovation that you've brought to the world and to the industry. Well, I started with fashion, actually, at the core of everything I did. I went to Central St. Martins in London. I studied to be a fashion designer. Um, and that is in, an incredibly big part of, of my job and my passion. But um, it's changed, you know, along with that, this way of working, which is unheard of. I'm still the only fashion designer in the world, certainly in the luxury sector, that is working in this way with some kind of consciousness and mindfulness. And so outside of the, the creativity, which is how I started, there is now a kind of hand-in-hand -hand conversation about how we make things, what materials are available to me. Because when you work in that way, I have far less materials that I can work with. Um, for example, we don't work with any PVC at Stella McCartney. So all sequins are made out of PVC and PVC is petroleum, it's oil. And so when I go, oh, I love, you know, I want to have a sparkly sequin dress, I can't do it because I, well, I can do it, but I have far less options available to me. I maybe have 10 sequins as opposed to 10,000 sequins. So the creativity, I have to really, I think, 
think outside of the box even on that front. And I definitely have to work harder with my teams to find a, a, you know, an alternative supply chain. And you know, even here at COP, um, we're working on really showcasing the innovation that we've, we've you know, worked on at Stella McCartney with our suppliers. And we have to work from the, the start, the very, very start. We have to work with the farmers. We look at the soil. We look at regeneration. We look at organic. We look at everything being sustainable. And then that starts part of the conversation of creativity. That's amazing. Speaking of COP28, I know that you have uh, an amazing sustainability, sustainable market, yeah. innovation for tomorrow's solutions. And you also co-founded an investment fund, SOS, that supports and creates more like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So what is your expectation with this uh, participation in COP28 uh, besides showing the innovations uh, to people? You know, I realized early on that what I was doing, I was working with our suppliers, but because it's such innovation, it's such a new way of working, a lot of them are scientists, you know, they're not fashion suppliers. So it's, none of it is conventional. And I, I realized very early on that I was working with people that didn't understand fashion and they didn't understand what I as a designer needed to make, for example, the bags that you're looking at yeah. here. And so I would develop very closely the materials with, with these, um, these young innovations or these suppliers. And I realized that I was sort of doing a different job, not a, you know, a, a different role of a conventional fashion designer. And so I then thought, okay, I'm working with these suppliers. I'm helping them develop the material that then I can then use, that then I can sell, that then I can order off them, and then I can manufacture and distribute. And then I was like, I need to close that chain because I need these people to survive and grow and I need them to swap out bad fashion practice for good fashion practice. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to invest in them and to help them have and be the future of fashion. Um, we are one of the most harmful industries in the world to the environment. Every single hour, a truckload of fast fashion is buried or burnt. You know, a billion animals are killed in the name of fashion every year, and that's cutting down 17% of our rainforest. It's using our water inefficiently. It's using electricity inefficiently. And not only that, the human welfare aspect to that is a conversation. You know, these, um, these methods are cruel and cancerous, and the chemicals that are used are, are terrible to, to the humans that have to interact in that. So... That is, you know, the fund is a big, big part of the conversation for me. I really wanted to raise money to support innovation, to then scale up okay. and be, you know, a realistic option for my industry and to swap out real leather with maybe a leather that's completely plastic free called Miram that we work that's yes. in the fund that is using a rubber based natural material you know, or, you know, so there's so many things and that's, we've brought that to COP. So we've brought all of those innovators here, which is incredible. They've traveled from all around the world. And I would love for you to come and meet them because they are the true superstars of this story. Certainly, I'm going tomorrow for sure. And I <laughs> hope to see you again, uh, again there. So your delegation in the COP, I mean, the whole value chain, and I think scaling up is very, very important mm -hmm. because also it gets to afford affordability, it gets to reaching uh, more people uh, with the same quality and sustainable material. But there's also the aspect of policy regulations uh, to incentivize brands that actually go this path. Yeah. Where do you feel 20 years later uh, you are in this journey? Sadly, we're not far enough, really. I mean, I, I tell people often because they can kind of, there's one example for my business where the the non-leather shoes that I'm wearing, for example, right now, because they're non-leather, they um, can be taxed up to 30% more when I take them into America as opposed to a leather pair of shoes that are exactly the same. In fact, if I take a centimeter of leather and I put animal leather and I put it on my vegan shoes, the taxation disappears. Now that is something I take in my margin. I swallow that up as a business, um, but I don't put it on my consumer. Mm. And it means that I'm being penalized. I'm basically being charged and penalized for not killing animals and not using those chemicals and actually trying to not cut down our rainforests. Now, I should be incentivized. It's completely the opposite way around. The people that are killing the animals and chopping down the rainforest should have a taxation instead of me. So the policies and the laws that I'm here to talk about at COP that I'm going to mm -hmm. try and bring into my... Um, 
into my industry, I think is critical now. You know, that for me is my mission and it's not yet in place. There's no real policing of the fashion industry. I think that people can't see it too. I really realize that people are not in touch with how the fashion comes into their lives. People don't understand that the cotton outfit that you're wearing there comes from a crop. It's farmed. There's soil involved. There's a, you know, yeah. it's it's an agriculture. And so at Stella McCartney, we've been working on funding a, a regenerative cotton scheme. You can meet them at the um, SOS, at the Sustainable Solutions at COP. And it's a family-run business from Turkey. And we, um, we had to pay to do a pilot. No, we didn't get any grants. There was no government grant there. And we started with five hectares of regenerative cotton. And now we're at nearly 100. And, you know... There definitely needs to be laws that help encourage people like me and certainly the next generation of people that want to go into fashion, that want to start a brand, that want to work in the business of fashion. They need to be incentivized. They need to be rewarded for doing good for the planet. I agree with you. And I think uh, it's not your first COP, right, participation. Do you feel the conversation is moving forward? In fashion, sadly, no. I'm okay. still really the only fashion brand here at COP. And whilst that's a compliment... It's also a lonely place to be, to, to only, you know, mm. only find me having this conversation still so far into my career. And when so many people are becoming aware about the environment, I think the fashion industry is getting away with, you know, literally murder, but also it's not, it's not on the radar and people don't understand that it's a very harmful industry because people want to think of it as beautiful handbags and beautiful dresses and, you know, glamour and escapism. And I guess part of my job, I feel, is to give people information so they can be armed with what they need to make the right consumption. You know, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, I think a huge part of this conversation is down to the leaders and the politicians, but I also believe that consumers really are in charge and they need to know it and they need to have information and then they can make a choice because... The consumer's powerful. Like, I think that we're great. I feel like we should celebrate our choices better. I agree. And as a retail partner, Shell Hoop Group, we're very proud uh, that you are one of our brands as well, because we also have very strong sustainability commitments to be net zero by 2040. And as a retail business, we're often asked that question. We don't manufacture, we don't have a fashion mm -hmm brand that we manufacture. But as a retailer, we really try to make sure we deliver as well on our partners' sustainability uh, commitments. Just this morning, actually, we uh, signed an agreement, an MOU with LVMH and multiple retailers and, and landlords on sustainability, mm. on, uh, you know, even electricity and, yeah. and water and the use of uh, the stores, the malls themselves. And more importantly, the education that we get to the consumer. Yeah. Um, we also just finished a, a circularity report, and this is fresh off the oven, so uh, we'll tell you the, the insights from it. But we uh, and our insights team, of course, uh, interviewed over 1,300 consumers from the Middle East region, mm. ask them about re-commerce, circularity, whether they buy pre-loved uh, or they are willing to engage yeah. in sustainable fashion. Today in the Middle East, it's a business of $500 million, which is not, not much, but it is anticipated to grow 10 to 15% uh, per but year. But I think it's people like you that hold a lot of, you know, you hold a lot of the power. And I believe that the people at the table also need to take responsibility because I set my own policing. I set my own, 100%. you know, at, at Stella McCartney, it's my choice with my teams and we do this because we care and we put limitations on ourselves. And I believe, for example, here, dare I suggest they could have a no fur policy and it could be a rule. And all of these same brands could be in the mall, but they could just not supply fur to your mall. Now that has, is a courageous, bold and brave thing for Shalom to do. But if they really cared, they could do it. And I'm sure they do really care. And your consumers are going to go that way anyway. And it's great PR. It's great. You could be the first. You could be the trailblazers. So there's there's levels of what people can do. Yeah. if they. And truly, I believe if the power doesn't start there, because this is an industry that is not, it doesn't have policy that says there cannot be fur. 100 million animals are killed every year just for fur. Now, if the people that buy 
the, you know, the brands and the brands come into this mall and you say, sorry, we don't have fur in this mall, like Selfridges, like other brands, you know, other multi-brand malls have done, that's when you start to make change. And that's when people go, you know what? Oh, let's make 10 less fur coats a year because we can't sell it in Dubai. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, we are definitely taking small steps in, but in that's uh, a bold, the brave step. Don't of sustainability. take small steps. <laughs> take brave steps. We don't have definitely. a lot of time. Yeah, and like I'm, I'm that person that's going to say that. That's kind of my job in the industry. That's that's amazing. Talking about the consumers, I mean, I think this is part of the conversation. It's there's. Uh, Sometimes uh, we hear that the consumer isn't ready for a certain thing or a certain topic or behavior change. And in fact, for us, we are taking the responsibility of education, yeah. taking the consumer on the journey. Maybe you can share some insights from your experience. How did you take your global consumers and what can we say to convince regional consumers to go on the journey of choosing sustainably? Less is more. And, um, you know, I think one of the on main things is. You don't have to sacrifice style and luxury and desirability for sustainability. I think if you look around you at these products, you would never know this was a sustainable fashion house. And it's the same for any consumer. If something is beautiful and desirable and well-made, really that's the first, the first entry point. If I made ugly uncomfortable because they're made out of organic cotton or they were scratchy or they were thick or they, you know, you can't compromise. It would, it, that in itself is not sustainable. It might be made yeah. in the, out of the best products in the most, you know, responsible way. And if it's ugly and it's not well designed, it doesn't feel good. It's not going to sell anyway. And it still becomes landfill. So for me, that, you don't have to be sustainable and tell people to buy better or, you know, you can actually just do it. And I honestly, I'd be so, and coming back to the fur thing here, I'd be really interested to know how much fur you sell here and is it actually meaningful and would people even, even notice if this mall didn't sell fur? Like they probably wouldn't even notice in all honesty. So that, you know, and I think that's an important part of the conversation. But I think, you know, the biggest part of being sustainable is animal agriculture. It has by far, when we do our env environmental reports internally at Stella mm -hmm. McCartney, and we measure, um, you know, why and how we had just now 95% sustainable show in Paris. It yes. was our most sustainable show ever. Gorgeous. And thank you, thank you. But you couldn't tell. Yeah. You know, you're not sacrificing. It's, a, it's a, like any other fashion show. In fact, they're a bit better. <laughs> but... um. You know, we know that the, the biggest measure that we have that makes us sustainable is not having animal agriculture, not using leather. So for me, I guess one of the first things I'd say is be educated and maybe buy less leather, buy things that are going to last that you can then resell so that that also becomes part of a business investment for you, or you can rent things or you can, you know, this and vintage, I'm a huge fan of vintage. I know that it's possibly not so popular in this part of, of the world, but I think it will become more and more popular. It's because, getting more, I think. Yeah, it will. It, it, there's no doubt yeah. because it's sustainable and it's also individual. And I think more and more people are, are having their own expression of who they are through what they wear. And if you buy vintage, nobody else has it. And I think there's something truly exciting about that. You know, we also work with uh, startups and small businesses in our incubator, The Greenhouse, and we support uh, small fashion designers from the region. Uh, there are a few rising uh, designers that start sustainable by design. What advice would you give them? Of course, they're choosing a harder journey, maybe the harder ride. Yeah. Uh, so what would be your advice to them? Well, you know, at the beginning, this was not... Um, it didn't, wasn't a selling point for my brand, but now mm. for sure it's my point of difference in my, um, in my industry. And I, it holds great value for us. You know, when it's the conversation that I have. It's the thing that sets us apart from everyone else. So already, I think if you can start in a sustainable way, you have something interesting to talk about that nobody else has to talk about. I also think it's criminal to, to start a brand new in today's world and not have an element of sustainability. And I think you're in danger of being very irrelevant if you don't, because I think the fashion industry is all about being relevant. And I don't think fur is relevant. I don't think leather is going to be as relevant uh, in the years to come. I think people are going to start connecting animal welfare, human welfare. They're going to start connecting the dots 
And I think that you have to you have to be part of the fashion movement. You know, before I came here, I was, uh, you know, prepping and my boys were all around me like, mom, it's Saturday. What are you doing? Aww. And so I'm like, I'm interviewing Stella McCartney. And they started researching and telling each other, do you know who she is? You know that she's the sustainable and Aww. she doesn't, <laughs> she takes care of animal welfare. And I wow. think the new generation is Amazing. really very proud and engaging um, yeah. in sustainable practices more and clean and natural. Even I mean, boys, it's their, they, it's, they talk yeah, about clean it, but it's beauty in their and hair care. You know, exactly. it's their planet. Yeah. We're handing over this planet to them. And and it's a conversation that they're having at school. It's a conversation that they're seeing. When we eat, we eat better. We have that conversation. When we put skincare on, we, we have that conversation with ourselves. When we talk politics, when we see the environment changing around us, when we talk about architecture and we talk about cars, this is a conversation that is Absolutely. is part of their generation and it's not yet part of the fashion industry. So the fashion industry is in danger of becoming completely unfashionable. Part of your participation, you're talking about your sustainability report, mm -hmm. your impact report. Uh, I mean, you're sustainable by design and still you measure and yeah. you report. Uh, what is it that you're reporting on and how do you see your progress and your goals that you set for yourself? We're reporting on our own personal um, environmental impact. And we do it because we're crazy and, and I don't know, nobody else really does it, but we started many years ago and it's a great way to measure how successful we are. You know, we don't just success, we don't just measure our success by numbers at Stella McCartney or press, you know, press coverage. We, the box. <laughs> we measure ourselves yeah. on our sustainability numbers and if we're getting better. So we measure it in a number of different ways. You know, we, we compare it to different seasons. We look at how we ship. We look at where we source. We look at how we make. We look at, you know, how many animals we aren't killing. We, you know, it's measured in so many different ways. We can give you all of the information, but we look at the metal we're using. We use aluminium in all of our bags and it's fully recyclable. We look at the sustainable partners and the innovators that we're working with and the, you know, we're, we're, we've just done an amazing campaign, an, an amazing collaboration with Verfklico, which is using all of their waste from their grapes, the skins of the grapes. And we've made faux leather bags out of it. We've used the cork in their champagne bottles to make shoes. So those kind of things really bump our numbers up. We also look at waste. We look at how many people have ordered things, what we haven't, you know, when, when mm. things haven't sold so well. And, and um, we look at the growth that we've made as a business compared to our sustainability growth. There's so many different ways. It's quite complex. But um, I mean, it would be wonderful if the rest of the industry measured in the same way. And then we could all truly have a benchmark. Stella McCartney, we could be here for hours and hours. <laughs> I know you have an appointment and the producers are telling us to stop. Uh -huh. It was such a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very much for making the time. We're really very proud I'm of very our happy collaboration. To be here. And I really would love, we've been talking about it, we want to bring the sustainable solutions market right here outside there we want people Let's to see it. everything yeah more and i'm going to be to really tell. excited when you stop doing fur i'm uh, call <laughs> we're me. not doing <laughs> no when you stop selling fur. thank you very much right. it's such a Take pleasure care. thank you thank you all for watching